Jó estét kívánok, üdvözlöm Önöket a francia intézetben. A Frédéry Krause francia intézet igazgatója vagyok. Sajnos nem megbeszélek magyarul, de kicsit, kicsit, egyekszem, egyekszem. Uh, sorry, my Hungarian is poor, my English is well, so I will speak in French. Bienvenue euh, ce soir à l'Institut français pour un bel événement. On est absolument enchanté de recevoir dans nos murs l'Institut du Danube pour une euh, toute première It fois. Me great Et vous pouvez le dire aussi. Et tout de suite, je vais laisser la parole to à work here together with the Danube Institute. And I'd like just like to hand over without further ado to Her Excellency the Ambassador of France uh, to Hungary. Just as the director was kind enough to mention, it gives us great pleasure to actually welcome you here for a debate that actually is uh, fitting perfectly into a series of debates organized by the French Institute. Uh, and permit me to express my gratitude to the Danube Institute. Uh, first of all, I'd like to greet John O'Sullivan, who actually organized uh, this evening. We are extremely happy to welcome here Madame Rosalind Chenu, and we are also happy to welcome Maria Iyes, that I've already had the honor of meeting, and I know Janos Savoy has worked in a multitude of different areas, but still, to me, he is and forever will be the ambassador of Hungary, former ambassador of Hungary to Paris, and we're also very happy to welcome Magda Sabo, and a very warm word of welcome to everybody in the audience. Uh, this is uh, going to be a very interesting chain in Hungarian-French cooperation, as I understood correctly, there's also going to be English here. So I wish you all a very good evening. Uh, Your Excellency, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, on behalf of the Danube Institute and the Hungarian Review, uh, may I thank the French, the French ambassador and our colleagues at the Institut Francais, with whom we count ourselves very fortunate to be presenting this event and may I welcome you all to it. This is a very rare event because we shall be exploring and celebrating a major initiative in both cultural diplomacy uh, and in cultural policy and public diplomacy that in addition to being worthwhile in itself was a profound and important historical success. That initiative was the Congress of Cultural Freedom and our principal guest tonight is Rosalind Chenu, the distinguished French scientist, educator, and poet, um, who joined the Congress and became for 20 years, well, I can't really use the modern phrase cultural warrior because it means something quite different now, but certainly uh, let me call her a partisan for truth and beauty and for the free mind. A little history is perhaps necessary here. At the end of the Second World War, when the Soviets still enjoyed considerable moral prestige, and the future seemed possibly to be communist, Moscow launched a series of peace congresses across Europe, appealing to intellectuals and writers to join them in outlawing war, colonialism, racism, and all the usual suspects. Initially, they had some success and recruited many well-meaning liberal intellectuals to their service. The Congress was established as the West's response to this subtle cultural subversion. Um, it held its own conferences. It invited American and West European writers to defend liberalism and democracy. It countered the Soviet uh, arguments um, uh, with arguments of its own. And it, most important of all, it kept alive the lines of communication between writers in the two worlds, communist and free. Our main guest tonight, Rosnan Chenu, remembers her service to this noble cause in her recent book and in an interview she conducted with, National, with the Hungarian Review. She was one of a surprisingly small band of intellectuals and artists who sent books across the Iron Curtain, invited dissidents on cultural exchange programs, published in the West, Sam is that literature that was being suppressed in the East, and when necessary, as it was too often, 
aroused Western public opinion to protect the rights and liberties of intellectuals who had come to the attention of literary critics in the KGB. All these were works of democratic solidarity uh, and of um, uh, charity, as well as of public diplomacy. The Congress also created major journals of political and cultural criticism, Der Monat in Germany, Preuve in France, extending even to Quadrant in Australia, and above all, Encounter in Britain. These journals, far from being works of propaganda, elevated every kind of debate in, these, in their countries, thus reminding writers and readers of the inherent superiority of the free society and of the free mind over their ideological enemies and substitutes. Today, we're discussing in particular the help given to Hungarian intellectuals by the Congress over the years. We're doing so in the Institut Francais, which has continued France's long and proud tradition of transmitting the great heritage of French civilization to those who love it or will happily learn to do so. Other nations and other cultural institutes need to learn the lessons, lessons from the French Institute and its cultural self-confidence. In her book, um, Through a Screen Darkly, the American cultural critic Martha Bells laments the decay of formal cultural diplomacy, and in particular, the apparent lack of interest among young American diplomats in promoting elite, that is, classical culture. Um, exhibitions, concerts, lectures, events like this evening. This is sad because it means that people in the countries to which they are posted will have less access to music, painting, novels, theater, and ideas, um, which are beautiful in themselves, uh, which convey the spirit and grandeur of, in this case, the United States, but it's true for other countries as well, and the West generally. But the reason for the reluctance of diplomats um, intuited by Miss Bales is sadder still. It is that these kind of cultural exchanges are now deemed ineffective and politically incorrect. If Miss Bales's intuition is right, then cultural diplomats, cultural diplomats rather, are almost comically wrong. One of the most important trends of the last few decades is the enormous and growing popularity of Western classical music in the non-Western world, including Asia and China. This is reflected in the names and nationalities of many young soloists. But a personal experience may make the point more sharply. When I visited Hanoi 12 years ago, I attended a symphony concert at which a local composer played his own piano concerto. The concert's second half was devoted to a series of waltzes um, by Strauss and Lehar, what Thomas Beecham used to call lollipops. Except for a handful of tourists, the audience in the packed hall was almost entirely young Vietnamese people. They greeted all of the items with passionate enthusiasm, uh, but especially the waltzes, later dragging back the conductor to play encores time after time. They also cheered the local chief executive officer of the multinational company that had sponsored the concert. Uh, was this some patriotic Austrian or German company? No, it was Yamaha. In the challenging new world of contending cultures and philosophies, we re really cannot rely on multinational enterprises to transmit our traditions and our values. The students of Hong Kong are telling us today that they look to us for more than waltzes. And I look forward to this panel, an extremely distinguished one, to tell us exactly what else we should be giving them in cultural diplomacy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for these forwarding words. 
And I would like to thank you, first of all. I would like to thank the Danube Institute and the Bacchani Foundation uh, for having made possible to organize this debate with Rosny Chenu. So I would like to thank the presence of Oshoya Nimet, uh, who was the editor of uh, the book uh, in Hungarian of Rosny Chenu. I would like to thank the French Institute because it's quite a generous offer of its part to be able to organize our event uh, in between these walls. And uh, the French Institute is really well known for uh, having this kind of debates. So this round table uh, will be around Roselyne Chenou. Uh, who has uh, published recently her book, uh, Struggle Against uh, Dictatorship in Paris. She is a cultural responsible of the CCF, and, uh, and she will, I think, present herself a little bit uh, more later on, and a warm welcome to Maria Iyes, who is a cultural and art historian and critic, and she's a former ambassador of Hungary and France, and she could really see with her own eyes the actions and activity of the CCF. I think uh, Alabama and Budapest, uh, our president, the president of CCF, uh, is very well known here in Hungary. It's like uh, uh, a Hungarian citizen by adoption, and uh, uh, he is president uh, for uh, uh, a lot of things and a uh, uh, warm welcome for you, Mr. President. Rizlin Chanu, well, I think you already had several times this question, why this book? And I would like to ask it, or, uh, but this question, but in another way in a different way, in a way. So why, after 40 years, after the end of the Congress, you thought important to write this book? And uh, what were the latest elements and factors that motivated you to write this book? Well, I would like to be very simple. First of all, there is no, no colleague of CCF uh, who, after its end, uh, would write anything. I think it was later on that other authors, other writers, uh, completely, uh, let's say like that, uh, strange strangers to the Congress wrote things. And then I, well, uh, read these books. I was just like shocked because there were many errors in these books. So I think it was something moral. Uh, my choice, choice was made from a moral point of view. I wanted to reveal uh, reality and the truth. And there is a sentence of Camus. I, I'm a revolutionary, so I exist, and that's why I decided to write this book, because I was a witness, a real one, yes, uh, and this book uh, 
is so precise, it is so detailed after so many years. So how could you write this book in this way? Uh, uh, could you use some documentations in order to, to write this book? Yes, first of all, I had my notes, my personal notes uh, that uh, uh, I could use. These were my first sources. And yes, I could gather some documents, um, some reviews, some letters also that I could use. And yes, I went to the Congress archives in order to find uh, a lot of documents, mainly in the, the University of Chicago, but also in Madrid, to Lisbon. I went to Switzerland land in order to find reports, trimestral reports on our annual activity. And I had correspondences and copies that I could find. Um, and I gathered all these elements, let's say about 6,000 archive documents. Uh, uh, so I gathered all these documents in order to be able to reveal details and to be able to write this book. So, well, uh, you had to go anywhere in Europe, everywhere in Europe, in order to get these documents. Yes, because I had to go in to the archives, to Spain, to Portugal, because we had uh, a secret committee during the Franco dictatorship, so, and uh, we had Salazar, so I could go also there because we had uh, some uh, committees. All right, and uh, at the time when Congress was funded, why? Uh, why it was so important for the people who organized it to, to, to be able to give to people this free thinking. Yes. I think, first of all, we had a congress in Berlin. We had something for some days in Berlin, first of all. And afterwards, we had this idea uh, for one or two years we had uh, people in Baltic countries uh, who found it important to uh, have these ideas. So we had emigrants in Berlin, uh, very important uh, people, uh, and in 38 or 39, uh, they came to the States. And in, if I recall it rightly, correctly, uh, in 42 he became an uh, American citizen and then he was um, a soldier in the American army. And he was the one who some years later, uh, he had this idea to create a congress for cultural freedom. So this is the first step. So it was in Berlin uh, that we had five days meeting, and uh, we had several European-American participants, but also from uh, Latin America and Asia. And after these five days, we decided to create a permanent, continuous organization. So this is the uh, birth of the Congress. OK, uh, in between uh, 50 and 68, this Congress existed. Yes, in the beginning, uh, we had urgency. In 50, we had to start a program in order to help intellectuals, writers, artists in Eastern Europe. Uh, the, uh, of course, uh, it, 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 it's not possible to create a whole world in seven days. So for the Congress, uh, we had to have some time also 
to be able to progressively give birth to our programs. And first of all, we had a non-professional team and we had to start in a way, so we had a program, first of all, to help these new communist Eastern European countries. And first, so uh, Eastern Europe, then uh, Latin America, and then Spain, Portugal, later on, and Greece and Asian countries, so the whole world. But it was uh, really something which was progressive. So we started with Eastern European countries in 51, 52, and five years later we went global. So we had to start in a way, and then we were more and more active. And yes, uh, why dictatorships in plural? Uh, it is dictatorships in your book, so that's why you chose this plural firm for your book. Yes, because we had right wing and left wing dictatorships too. So you had several dictatorships. So, uh, first of all, Eastern European countries, and then in the end of the 50s, we had right dictatorships in other countries. And artists um, and writers were uh, victims. And the CIA could see that, and they were helped by the United States. In other countries, uh, like, uh, of course, Western Europe, uh, assistance needed to be given, or Eastern Europe, uh, assistance needed to be given to uh, intellectuals who were victims of the ruling regime. So this solidarity, if you wish, brought together uh, these groups of people, groupings, and of course, uh, was adapting to the history and to the events in the different countries in Europe, in Africa, and elsewhere. I can see that you have a very, very valuable document there with you, and could you tell us a few words about it? It was in Berlin, yes. In Berlin, well, we had a very, very important document. This, what you're seeing here, is the original piece. And this is the Manifest of Free People. It's actually a, to be precise, it's a document of 14 action points. And I, I am, uh, basically, we look and we say that it is an absolute justice and truth that the freedom of uh, opinion is one of the unalienable uh, rights of people. Point number two, uh, the freedom of uh, the uh, opinion means for everybody that uh, one can have an opinion even if this opinion does not concur with that of the government. A person who doesn't have the right to say no is none other but a slave, and so on. So, could you actually mention a few signatories to this manifest, manifesto? Of course, you had uh, the participants of the Colloquium of Berlin, and also later on it was handed from person to person, it went around, it was circulated. There is 50 names here, 5-0, uh, different kinds of uh, intellectuals who signed it from Europe, from Africa, from Asia, from uh, from Europe, uh, Arthur, Arthur Schlesinger, Denis de Rougemont, uh, an English, a Turkish person, Germans, Swiss, French intellectuals, quite naturally. So indeed, the document itself, if you want, circumnavigated the world. And uh, about 100 people ended up signing it. Thank you very much.
Pierre-Emmanuel has already been mentioned uh, tonight, and we know that your fates are very much intertwined during the different, uh, during the past or those decades. Could you tell us the kind of role he played, uh, Pierre-Emmanuel, in this movement? Pierre-Emmanuel was a great writer, a great poet during the period of the resistance, and he actually went on to become a journalist in order to make a living. And uh, he was very active during the course of programs that was about organizing different cultural events uh, in England and in the United States of America. And of course, he was given more and more work with the French radio. And he was told, well, you are a poet, so we cannot employ you. Well, I'm generalizing a bit, paraphrasing a bit. So we, they said to him, you act, uh, you do what you like. So in 1947, uh, the French, so we are 19, 1947, autumn of 1947, the French foreign ministry wants to find out how uh, they are organizing in Europe and in Western Europe and in, uh, well, the future Eastern Europe, how the foreign, the French institutes were functioning and operating in comparison with the Goethe Institute. So Pierre Emmanuel agrees to actually travel to Bulgaria, Romania, Yugoslavia and Hungary to do this two month long tour, two and a half months precisely. And uh, he actually visited all these countries, we're talking Eastern Europe of the time, and returning upon his return, he actually writes this series of articles uh, in a newspaper called Week in the World. And these articles actually described the operation, the functioning of the different French institutes. And it was back then, actually, I have to say that the French Institut Francaise was created here in Budapest. No, to be precise, no, I'm sorry. It was in this building, definitely, where uh, they created the Institut Francaise. And in this uh, series of publications, Pierre Emmanuel described his discoveries, the discoveries that he made in Romania, what he saw in Yugoslavia, what he saw in Bulgaria, what he saw in Hungary. And he actually saw what was coming in these countries, what was in the making. And he actually described this in his um, pieces. And in early nine, these articles appeared in early 68, and back in that time, the French uh, leftist movement. I don't want to use the word dictatorship. But uh, Aragon actually turned his back on Pierre Emmanuel, and uh, Pierre Emmanuel all of a sudden found himself isolated, just like Albert Camus was, if you wish, excommunicated uh, because of his uh, debate and uh, argument with Sartre. And Pierre Emmanuel lived in great solitude for years after that, and uh, some years later, published several articles in a publication called Preuve, uh, a proof in English, Preuve, and uh, Michael Jesserson and his uh, deputy read these articles, and uh, in Pierre Emmanuel read a very important article about Hungary in 1956, well, about the 1956 events uh, in, uh, in Hungary. And it is, this is how, two years later, he was offered 
he was offered the chance to join uh, this, if you wish, representation uh, of uh, the coming together of intellectuals as a poet, as an author, who found it extremely important that culture should not only be a cultural commodity, that it should also have, depending on your faith, a spiritual uh, interpretation to it. And this is how he joined the movement. And it was immediately given uh, the go-ahead, and he was allowed to publish freely, and he immediately had an, uh, an idea to actually convene different kinds of conferences and colloquia where where we could provide or they could provide a kind of a platform uh, for Europeans to come together. But to be precisely, he was really responsible for the European program, uh, whereas I myself, who had arrived uh, to this organization four or five years earlier, well, the basic idea was that we would organize these colloquia with the intent of providing a platform for Anybody arriving from every European country, predominantly we're talking about countries, of course, European countries that were, that had fallen victim to some kind of a leftist or rightist uh, regime. And, well, you have uh, a degree in math, math, mathematics and chemistry. How did you actually meet, come across Pierre Manuel, and how did this retraining uh, uh, happen? Uh, I actually met Pierre Emmanuel thanks to a Spanish author who actually left Spain, went to France, uh, fleeing uh, the Franco regime at the end of the uh, Spanish Civil War. It's Jose Bergami that we're talking about. And basically, this was in 1957 or 58 that he was actually allowed to return to his country after 20 years of exile. Well, yes, indeed. I was a student of chemistry. At and I'm studying, I was studying in Paris at the time, and Bergamin, at that time, of course, was actually older than my father, and was in France, and, well, we struck a friendship. Uh, I, the young chemistry student, and this extremely old gentleman, an old gentleman who is actually older than my father. So there's this very, very close, tight-knit friendship that uh, we created. He managed to return he was allowed to return to his country in 1958, and so now in 1962, and Bergami is extremely afraid, he's extremely afraid that the communists are going to execute him or kill him in Madrid. Quite naturally, of course, uh, this would have been, this whole killing, uh, the, the Francoist would have been framed for this. So he says to me, if I go to Paris, uh, I should go to five of his closest friends. If something was to happen to him, they should not believe the official explanation for his death. So this is how I actually went as a messenger to talk to these five closest friends. Some of them I knew. And among these five closest friends was Pierre Emmanuel who had only heard of before. And, of course, the moment I return to France, I go visit these five people, and I pass on the message from Bergamin, Pierre Emmanuel included. And that is how we struck up a friendship. And then, later on, two years later, Pierre Emmanuel comes and visits me and says to me, says to me, my assistant is actually uh, going to marry. Uh, it's a part-time job. Would I like to take it? And uh, uh, as it often happens when you have major Hello. decisions in life, Madame you just go ahead and say it. In, in, you just instinctively say yes. And I've Vous never forever been sorry about that decision. So well, you've already mentioned in a few words uh, Central and Eastern European activities of this uh, Congress. Question is, the assistance uh, directed towards these countries, when did this become intensive? Well, this also happened gradually. Uh, meetings, people to people meetings uh, that actually uh, were happening in the framework of the work of this Congress. And, uh, then, then there was a Hungarian anth uh, an anthology of Hungarian poetry that was published. 
later on there was another anthology, a Polish one that was published, and then ultimately the anthology on Romanian poetry. And Ladislav Garam, who was living in uh, Ladislav Gara, who was living at the end of the 20s in France, uh, he actually set out completely alone by himself to actually develop these anthologies, and he was actually pursuing an extremely innovative uh, approach, because what he did was he selected uh, certain poets that he wanted to include in his collection, so he selected the Hungarians who were living in Paris, who spoke French, French well. He actually asked them to translate these poems verbatim, and that was the big idea uh, of Gara, that these verbatim translations were then distributed among all these French poets who didn't speak a word of Hungarian, who actually used this uh, as a kind of a song sheet and actually went on to do their own French translation of this verbatim text. So this was the big idea of Gara, and that is where it all started. And then later on, uh, Gara and Pierre Emmanuel became, became the uh, managers uh, of these collections uh, at the Seuil Publishing House. And Emmanuel was responsible for culture in the Congress. And Pierre Emmanuel and Gara. Et puis il y a eu une anthologie suivante, anthologie de la poésie roumaine. Et si ma mère. We were working on the board of the publishing house. Then came, if I remember correctly, then came the Romanian anthology, which was actually published after uh, Gara's uh, passing. And Gierenski, Gierenski, the Polish colleague, actually stepped in and worked together with uh, Pierre Emmanuel at in the board. So this was the third anthology, the Romanian poems, and this was followed by a request made to a Portuguese colleague who then collected Portuguese poems. And I remember Gara bringing me, coming to me, and I didn't know, I didn't know, a few days before his suicide, he comes to me and he brings me this huge batch of documents. He brought documents that were signed, that were dedicated, and he said, I don't want these to be lost, I don't want these for anything to happen with them, uh, I don't want them to be smeared with paint, because actually he was renovating his flat, so he came to me with these documents and eight days later, one week later, he committed suicide. I, uh, I really did consider this a kind of a spiritual legacy. He wanted things to go on. He wanted things to, to be carried on after his death. And quite naturally, this was something that we did. Uh, the Portuguese anthology was basically, well, I was the one who went personally to Portugal, but it was a very, very slow, cumbersome effort. I didn't have staff to work for me a secretariat, and I actually found out that uh, Gallimard uh, and his uh, publishing house was actually publishing a French collection of poems. So we were thinking that all this work was in vain because we were by far not uh, at the end of uh, the preparations for the Portuguese anthology. And please understand correctly when I say this was only a series of anthologies um, that you did, or was there something else that you did to assist all these other, all these countries? Uh, of course, there were many other things. Uh, For Eastern European countries, well, we invited participants to seminars in France, for example, uh, they came, uh, 
if they could, if they had wises and yes, and we sent books also to them, but only on the demand, so we did not decide to send books like that whenever a new edition of uh, French philosopher Simon Weil was published, uh, but uh, there were some people completely in love, let's say like that, uh, with her uh, philosophy, so we were asked to send uh, the book, for example, voilà. but we didn't want to do any Merci. propaganda. We sent books on demand. Parler, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And Monsieur Sullivan, uh, Mr. Sullivan, uh, during the 28 Congrès, years of existence of the Congress and practically in 35 monde, countries uh, all over the world, you followed uh, the international uh, history when you heard for the first time, uh, when it was when you heard for the first time about this Congress, the well, activities. Well, I first uh, learned about it because of its fruits, so to speak. I mean, um, first of all, um, like um, uh, Jula Cardellani here in Hungary, and my, um, I was living in, uh, I was receiving at the, my local, at the library in my college, um, uh, the monthly, the, the magazine Encounter. And um, I found Encounter, reading Encounter every month regularly, first of all, gripping, I never missed an issue. Secondly, it was an education. It brought me into contact with uh, elements of uh, civilization, uh, philosophy, uh, music, criticism, any, um, the latest novel and where it fitted into the various grand traditions of the novel. Um, these were things which, as, uh, to a, a young and relatively hungry mind, I don't want to boast, but um, it, they were absolutely precious. And at the end of, um, when I left that college after about five years, um, I, I really had uh, had been given a thorough education in the in in the achievements of the Western civilization of every kind, not all of them in depth, plainly. But giving, which gave me a picture of the civilization uh, as a whole, British culture as a whole, the French culture as a whole, and so on, and the role of the United States, which, of course, um, um, interpenetrated and crossed with all of those other national cultures. So that was the first thing. The second was, I got to write for some of these organizations subsequently. I was invited to write for Encounter. Um, I met many, uh, through the names of people like Raymond Aron uh, and others were known to me through reading and I eventually, when I was covering politics in, in England and then later in the United States, I got the opportunity to meet many of the people whom I'd read and of course I had already therefore had an introduction to their thought. They were available to me therefore as writers and contributors. Um, I don't know that I can, and, and then finally, of course, I got interested in the actual history of the organization in, a, in the sense that, um, uh, that Rosalind had just given us an introduction to. Um, and um, uh, actually one of the historians of, of uh, the Congress for Cultural Freedom, uh, Peter Coleman, who died only last year actually, the age of about 96. Peter was a close friend of mine um, in his later years. Um, he wrote for National Review and then he, he himself edited Quadrant, one of the magazines that the Congress set up. And when I subsequently became editor, um, and I still work with Quadrant, I became, a, I received his close, uh, his friendship and his, uh, his advice on, on Australian politics, which I, where I was kind of an amateur. So I would say that um, the best way to know about uh, the, 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 the Congress was first of all, was to, was to read its products. And then you realize that there were people who didn't have your freedom in another part of, in the other half of Europe, who were being given the opportunity not only to read the best works and some of the latest uh, ideas and arguments from Western Europe and America, but the way they were getting access to some of the best elements of their own culture was via Paris and the Congress for Cultural Freedom. And of course I know that from, because my conversations with uh, um, and one or two, one or two people here actually, how grateful they were to receive um, uh, books from um, 
uh, from uh, the Congress over the years and to be invited to con Congress events. So um, obviously, uh, as a result of the work of the Congress, uh, and you know, I, I'm looking at this from the outside, it seems to me that when the wall came down and when the barriers disappeared, there were already people who had built up friendships and intellectual understandings about the way the world was going. And many of those now step forward from research institutes and libraries and uh, teaching posts and some from um, jobs they were forced to take as stokers and very humble jobs. They stepped forward into government and provided um, a, a political leadership in Central and Eastern Europe that was remarkable, and in the Baltic states as well, that was remarkable for uh, being of a very high intellectual and moral level. Um, I think how many countries, for example, does a musicologist go from his previous job to become president? has happened, I think, in Lithuania. And, and uh, that kind of change um, was much better than it might have been and much more peaceful than it might have been as a result of the work of the Congress because it meant that there was a kind of counter elite of a decent kind ready to step into the shoes of the defeated totalitarians. That's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Another question, because you talked about of the importance of reading, and there are some uh, or any people that you got to know and to uh, to establish some uh, friendship thanks to these books or documents that you could read. Since we're in Hungary. I think the best example, I'm trying to think of his name, I can tell, but you will know it because he's the author of Darkness at Noon. Arthur Kerstler, Arthur Kerstler. And uh, I got to know him because, um, uh, first of all, I read, his, I read several of his books and was uh, thrilled by them. I believe something is happening now with uh, Darkness at Noon. Is it not being produced as a new film or as a play? But I, I hope, I think there, it may be. I hope so. It's still got a lot of lessons for us. Um, but I subsequently met him because as someone who later contributed to Encounter, I was invited to their lunches. Uh, and, uh, and Arthur Kessler was a regular attendee at them. Um, well, um, it's, it's always hard when you're asked these kind of big damn questions. Uh, who else? Well, Ignazio Salone from Italy. Um, oh, I, I um, uh, several people from Germany, uh, not, no, um, Michael Nauman, um, and um, well, uh, as I say, names always vanish from my head whenever I'm asked this question. But but nonetheless, um, uh, oh well, of course Camus, and uh, whom I never met, of course, because he he died, I think, in fifty. He was killed in, in fifty eight. Um, but I started reading him. I Raymond Aron, I already mentioned. Um, the fact is that the Congress was a who's who of first-class liberal minds. Some of those liberals were conservatives, uh, uh, and some were liberal liberals, so to speak. One interesting one was James Burnham, because he left the Congress at a fairly early stage because he felt that, um, as a result of arguments within it, he felt that it would not prove to be a reliable defense against the Soviets when, um, when the Americans committed some kind of... Uh, uh, betise or some kind of folly or crime, uh, and there'd be a split. And in a way, that did happen with the Vietnam War. Um, but Burnham, of course, was an, an extraordinary, unique uh, intellectual of the right, who, in my view, is and who I, I've always valued. But he obviously was an in, was first an internal critic, and then I don't think he was ever a very strong external critic. I don't think he ever denounced the Congress. Later, did he? But but he would have denounced it if he d had done for it not being firm enough and, and that kind of thing. But, but he was an, int an interesting figure and, of course, now best known for his uh, debates with Orwell, but nonetheless um, a, a major figure in understanding the way of the world from a very conservative standpoint. And he was in the early days of the Congress. And I read him voraciously. His books are coming back, by the way. They're being republished. Merci. 
Thank you very much. Dear Rosalind, in uh, 68, uh, in the New York Times, an article was published on the financing of the Congress by the CIA. IA. And uh, there were a lot of errors in the article. You say it. Washington Post, the year after, uh, wrote about the subventions distributed by the CIA uh, via foundations and, for instance, the Congress. So, could you just, uh, in some words, a few words, uh, say or speak about this issue? Well, in the beginning of the Congress, as I've already mentioned, uh, the, uh, we had someone coming from uh, the U.S. Army in Berlin, and uh, he had the U.S. military uh, training, and he knew very well the CIA. Some years afterwards, uh, he had the idea to create the Congress, but we needed money. And he went to see some American U.S. Army uh, friends, uh, well, who were members of the CIA. And you can imagine that at the time, CIA, I don't know how many agents he had, but there were dozens all around the world. And, uh, and these they were, uh, were he could have any kind of political colors, he could have Democrats, some of them were, I don't know, communists or what else, and they, we could have also extreme uh, right-wing uh, ones too, so everything was represented. But the CIA at the time did what it wanted to do. So these old army friends gave money without any conditions because uh, he was to say that um, if there were political uh, conditions to observe, he would not, he preferred not to establish the Congress in 60. Six and 67, what happened? Very simply, some members, Republican members of the CIA, didn't want to admit, I read it afterwards, that that some rumors as if the Congress would have been financed by the CIA. So these Republican members of the CIA didn't want to sign uh, uh, the point of views and the opinion of the Congress in the Vietnam War. So this was the, 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 the source of all that. Well, I think it's a little bit, let's say, like that, idiotic, but it was like that. It's the reality. And some years after, we had the proof in New York uh, by the Ford uh, Foundation's uh, uh, management that, yes, uh, rumors began like that, uh, started with these members. Congress was very much too much democratical in their eyes. So because of this declaration or, or articles in the media, we, you had problems. Well, the Ford Foundation, who, it was the Ford Foundation which accepted to, to, to finance, um, but with, with a sum uh, which was the increasing year by year, and the Congress should have found complementary financing. And our new manager, administrative manager at the Congress, well, uh, he came 
from the Ford Foundation and uh, he didn't manage to find uh, this complementary uh, financing source. So that's why the CSF, uh, well, uh, finished. We, Pierre Emmanuel, we, you created something you said, so, yes, okay, it was the Eastern European program, in a way, so, we just invented, we invented a committee of writers and editors, some neutral thing, but on paper, we put it, but we, we knew very well we, that we had to do something. In 66, we created, established a new association uh, with uh, the headquarters in Geneva, and it was for European intellectuals' uh, help, so it was easier than uh, cultural freedom, so uh, this title was easier to use, and we could uh, correspond in this way. So, this foundation uh, with this name uh, could uh, send books and documents, but uh, as it was told, we just did not send books like that because we wanted to or we decided to, but on demand, so whenever it was asked to be sent. Sometimes De 1972, uh, we sent things like that. Uh, 72, it came back from Hungary. Article 20, uh, article so. 29. It was sent back because it was a prohibited uh, uh, document in Hungary. It was on the same list that tobacco, orange and mandarins because it was a publication against the political and economic uh, interests of Hungary and against Hungarian culture and uh, the Ministry of Popular Culture uh, should have authorized uh, the exportation of this kind of uh, book. It was Svetan Todorov, uh, André Breton on the list, uh, Paul F. Dokimo, and the essays of Montaigne, it was just like prohibited, just like oranges. Thank you very much for this very precise document. So it was in 72. So it was well, years, years, years after 56. Uh, dear Maria, you worked also with the Congress, and if I say worked, well, it was a mutual help. Uh, so you got documents, but you also helped the work of the Congress. But how did you do that? First of all, I was beneficiary of the Congress activity. I, I was quite naive. I have to tell it because I enjoyed these book books sent. And what is interesting is that I didn't know anything about the sendings and, and even if I was really on friendly terms with several fundators of the Congress, but I was quite naive how it did work. 
familier, so uh, I was much more uh, close uh, to, 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 to some other people in my family, but after uh, 56 uh, with Gara, Ladislas Gara, we uh, a publishing uh, work started in order to publish a lot of books. And of course, uh, de la, de la sympathie, uh, politique, uh, uh, we could uh, profit uh, uh, from the political travail, sympathy uh, with uh, Hungary. So uh, I just uh, saw uh, how this anthology was prepared and uh, des how des uh, uh, with et French et uh, translators and writers we could work with. So I saw so all this work going on, and uh, all this money uh, from there, it was coming, and how it was possible to work with all these people, I did not have all these questions at the time, I was a very young girl, but some years afterwards, uh, uh, it was Pierre and Emmanuel, uh, a great friend of my father, was younger than my father and uh, respected very much my father. So Pierre Emmanuel, uh, he was very, very kind with me. So it was Pierre and Emmanuel uh, that uh, presented Rosalind to me and we became friends. And uh, that's how I got to know the work of the foundation. And some years later, uh, we started to receive uh, these books. So normally, uh, at the start, it was my father uh, uh, who received the books, and then myself too, uh, books on sociology, social sciences, literature, uh, history. And uh, André Malraux, for, his, for example, the Imaginary Museum, and the Polish edition, these were not all expensive books. It was the Polish edition, but the packet edition. But we had them regularly. It was very important, and reviews, too. In the 60s, it was very important. Uh, people uh, at the time, I mean, Hungary, I was very young at the time, so it was just like something, something completely different. Uh, the artistic lives, it was not in Hungary uh, for us in the 60s, but it was in Paris. And to be able to receive all these books and reviews from Paris, for example, it was, it was, it was extremely interesting. It was just like uh, light. Uh, coming uh, to us, and my father was contacted by Roslyn, who sent a letter to him, and uh, it was a letter which was of extreme importance, because uh, this letter asked my father uh, to designate uh, some uh, people, artists, uh, students, uh, to be able to go uh, abroad, to participate to some programs. Uh, my father had to select people who had already done something important or promising. And in her book, Rosalind uh, just uh, explains that uh, at this very moment, we had help from the foundation. Uh, but this help was directed uh, to uh, intellectuals. Of course, it was important. All these people, of course, um, were not at all in the regime. Uh, they were opponents. 
je ne veux naturellement, je n'ai pas la liste des I haven't got the list of the people that at the time with the help of my father we obtained and established it was the Hungarian elite at the time against the regime I haven't got the list but it was a long one what, I, what I'd also like to say here is uh, at this time also and we are we are talking about the early 1970s I actually knew that there was this foundation that there that this foundation existed I didn't actually know how it worked I didn't know the actual uh, target group that it was reaching and I didn't know anything about its support and its financing and now in retrospect now that I have read Roslyn's book I have really understood how this all this actually functioned and it is in hindsight that I realize that there was a very, very serious contradiction here. On the one hand, you have a foundation which, which had to, if you wish, find its place in the legal framework of the country where it was operating, but also had to comply with all the expectations that the host country defined while at the same time, of course, these were the formal requirements, but informally it also had to have this clandestine operation because this basically was spreading by word of the mouth. And I say that this is a bit contradictory. I actually just, it came, it, it came to me just now I, while I was speaking about it. Uh, I found the response to my own question. It's something that you can observe in, in my actual practice that the whole activity that we conducted was based on trust. It was the trust of the mutual mutual trust between people who were actually involved in the whole activity because there was absolutely no control. So you really had to just place your trust in each other. And I do know that uh, we don't have all that much time today evening, but there is definitely something that I'd like to talk about here. And this is more like, I would say, the words of gratitude, because I'd like to express my gratitude here. Uh, I'd like if this uh, round table discussion was to be a discussion as a, that could be interpreted as a manifestation, an expression of gratitude. The gratitude of people uh, for and from all those people who worked in this foundation, who worked for the Congress, uh, and I'm talking all about, the about all the people who are no longer with us and about all the people who are still with us. Thank you very much, Rosalind. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I also would like to look to Mr. Savoy. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, do you have any personal memories about the activity of uh, this Congress or about the whole poem anthology or Gara? Of course, I do have my fair share of memories. However, these are memories that have somewhat faded, if you wish. I don't actually have, uh, I didn't keep a diary like Roslyn did, so I couldn't give you a hour by hour count account uh, of what happened. I myself, of course, was in contact with Ladislav Gara, and I owed it to Gara that I met others. Uh, it was He was the in-between person. Uh, he, he actually helped me to befriend Jula Shipos, who was actually a revolutionary from 1956. Gara actually sent me to him. Uh, Gara sent me to his home. Uh, the man had a vast collection of books, and um, there was this one room where you could select or peruse the books 
uh, and then these books were purchased by the Congress, so they didn't uh, produce them, they purchased them. I have to tell you that back then this was of great importance to me. The dictatorship, the regime that Roslyn Shinu talks about in her book, for me was the Soviet dictatorship, uh, the, the, the Russian, uh, uh, the Russians, as the go like to call, say, and and uh, to and like to say that the official story to us was basically untenable. The official interpretation of the events was untenable for us. The press and the authorities, the government uh, narrative was untenable for us. There was a they, they discussed. Uh, he, Basically, we had to find other sources of information. Uh, the, I'm also thinking of the journal that you mentioned, Proof, uh, the proof. I remember it had this yellow cover, and it was, I think, it was perhaps monthly or bi-monthly publication. I'm not sure. Excellent quality publication, I remember, and I also I distinctly remember how I always was looking forward for it to arrive. I was impatiently waiting for it to arrive. And what I remember, well, after all this time, well, I should say that what I remember is mainly that this publication, Proof, had a lot of literary pieces. Constantin, thanks to Konstantin Jelensky, we have already mentioned uh, his name earlier. Thanks to him, thanks to Konstantin, Proof published. Excerpts from uh, Viktor Romblovich. Uh, Borges, uh, I also discovered, thanks to Preuve, and this was of great significance to me because the discourse that we heard that was presented to us was uniform, uh, the narrative was uniform. And these foreign authors showed to us, showed to me, that there are several different plausible explanations for the events, and not only the official one. Well, thank you very much. Esteemed Roslyn, in conclusion, I would like to pose a question of a more personal nature. Peter Kende has already written in conjunction about your work, uh, about this publication, that this is a kind of a biography and uh, that uh, he gained so much uh, from the work of uh, the Congress. My question to you is, what is it that you gained uh, that not only, if you wish, touched you, but was also close to your heart as a result of working for the Congress? I would say that my work that lasted more than 10 years in the Congress actually opened the world to me. And I didn't come out at the end of that work with the same approach, mindset that I actually had going into this work. Human suffering. And this is not only the suffering of the intellectuals, it's the suffering of thinking people, uh, what I'm talking about. So the suffering of people who have sentiments, who have thoughts. Well, what I was allowed to do was to discover this very sad uh, world. And this also allowed me 
And I'm talking about the uh, victims of uh, the left and right, uh, these dictatorships. Well, I should say my home became a meeting of uh, like a public uh, space. You had Portuguese, Romanians, Greeks, you name it, uh, converging in my living room. And uh, I really didn't see any uh, distinction being made, separation between my professional and my private life. Uh, when all these scholarship students would arrive in Paris, uh, from Portugal, from, from Romania, from Poland or wherever, basically I endeavored uh, regardless of how long their scholarship lasted, I endeavored to give them board, uh, to actually feed them, because that allowed them to save money, that allowed them to stay longer. So for me, basically, I couldn't really delineate work and private life in this way. And uh, Emmanuel, in a way, also welcomed, for example, Pilinski in his home, who would spend uh, two, three weeks uh, with Pierre Emmanuel and his spouse. This way, he didn't need to pay for a hotel, therefore he could, his uh, money lasted longer. So what happened was the outside world actually infiltrated, if you wish, into my private sphere and therefore was mixed. Well, definitely not a very schematic uh, uh, interpretation. I believe we have talked a bit longer than we had envisaged, but I am sure that this was in no way um, boring for anybody. If there is anybody who would like to say anything in the, from the audience, well, this is your occasion to come forward and speak up. Uh, unfortunately, there is no microphone. Uh, can you please pass them a microphone, sir? Étant donné que les les buts de de du congrès étaient la, la diffusion de de la de la de la euh, de la de, de culture et de la science de de, de l'Occident, euh, en quelle mesure est uh, Est-ce qu'on pouvait uh, coordonner les efforts avec, uh, avec... Unfortunately, truth be said, we don't hear what is happening. Uh, uh, we know we can hear the murmurs of somebody speaking. So, unfortunately, I cannot provide interpretation for you, sir, but I'll be able to translate the response, Mais, however. Je dirais que c'était quand même très différent, parce que les instituts français ou autres... Well, French institutions, French institutes um, and other cultural institutes back at the time uh, had to actually obey certain norms uh, that were... We were not subordinated. This was a kind of a complementary work. Um, so... It was, this was basically person-to-person -person cooperation. Of course, we were allowed to work free, uh, and that was the difference. This was not an inst institutional, but person-to-person -person cooperation that you're talking about. And we'd like to express our gratitude to all those who actually spoke here, uh, who were members of the panel. We thank you very much. We thank those who... Uh, were present, the book is on sale, and I definitely think that once you purchase this book, uh, you are going to find out a lot more about this era. Thank you very much.